I guess this uh, mic is working or not working? Oh, okay, good. So, uh, I better get started. Um, first of all, obviously, I want to thank my hosts at ITEMP for um, giving me the opportunity of coming here to Harvard. And um, yes, it is completely true that I did study here a long time ago. Um, and uh, in fact, I'll be talking a little bit uh, about some work that Sidney Coleman uh, did and actually was, was doing around about the time I was here. Um, and so I, I did my early training in high energy physics, but actually I decided to switch to quantum optics, and uh, that's what I finished up doing my PhD in, um, in, in New Zealand under Dan Walls, who was actually an ex-student of Roy Glauber, uh, who's down here in the front row. 
Um, so it's great to be back here. Now, uh, what I want to talk about today is how to use all of the fantastic developments in quantum technology that we're developing all the time in the 21st century um, to do some new fundamental tests of physics. And I want to talk about different types of tests of fundamental physics from, from the usual ones that we're used to um, in microscopic physics. Um, so I'm going to talk about trying to test some macroscopic features of quantum physics. Uh, in particular, um, we, we often propose all of these fantastic technologies for things like metrology and cryptography, quantum computing. That's the usual kind of arena that we talk about in terms of applications of things like optomechanics um, or cold atoms. But can we use these new technologies to test fundamental ideas in physics that have been a problem for the last century or more? So the problem about doing that, just to start with, and I want to emphasize it's not an easy problem, is that you have to do quantitative calculations if you want to test a fundamental theory in physics like quantum mechanics. Now, we're used to doing quantitative calculations. Uh, for example, in QED, we can do calculations to many decimal places, and that's how we're normally used to testing physics. But if we want to do fundamental physics to test uh, new concepts in quantum mechanics, and we want to do it accurately, then we have to face the fact that the quantum technology experiments that you'd use involve many quantum modes, and the Hilbert space grows exponentially. So in many cases, number state methods will fail just due to this complexity. Obviously, you can't use mean field methods because these systems become entangled. Uh, and you want to linearize, that's going to fail with strong coupling. And now, your last resort is a variational technique, but it's now known that many of these variational methods may not converge uh, for some of these many body systems that you encounter in modern technology. So the solution we're going to use here um, is to use phase space expansions. And this is work that also has some roots at Harvard because it's techniques that generalize the methods uh, developed by, by Roy Glauber here at Harvard. Um, and these are useful because they're more scalable in many ways than some of the other techniques that are available, although, although some of the other techniques are now being developed quite rapidly and are becoming very competitive as well. So it's really good if we can have more than one method. But the main point is we can only test quantum theory if we know what it's predicting, and we have to know what it's predicting quite quantitatively. So we're not so interested in qualitative features here. We really want to test what quantum mechanics is predicting. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, work of a professor, Furry, uh, who has now forgotten in modern physics. Oh, well, I actually met him when I was a student here at Harvard. Uh, he was one of the first professors in quantum mechanics at Harvard. Uh, and this is a very famous picture because I believe this was a picture taken uh, when he was accused by uh, McCarthy of un-American activities or something of that type, um, which uh, is a kind of historical accident. I don't think he was really un-American, but um, he may have been slightly socialist, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So uh, he also wrote, much more importantly, uh, this wonderful paper on the quantum mechanical theory of measurement, um, in which he tried to answer questions posed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen when they first started talking about the correlations of separated particles and started to question uh, the completeness of quantum mechanics. And of course, this paper uh, that EPR wrote is the most cited paper of Einstein, uh, and it's really at the root of modern theories of entanglement and much of the work we do today uh, in quantum information. So, Furry pointed out something very simple. Uh, he tried to discuss various models that, which could resolve the issues raised by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and he pointed out that if when particles interact, they become entangled and correlated, there was a possibility that maybe as they became separated, uh, this mutual correlation could decay. So that was one of the models he proposed. Uh, it's not predicted by quantum mechanics, and so Furry pointed out that if this was going to happen, it would have to, to be due to some mechanism currently unknown in quantum mechanics. So uh, the question is, how can we test that? Now, one 
thing we do know is this idea of Fourier's uh, does not work for photons. People have separated photons by many kilometers. They still remain strongly correlated. Uh, you can get bell inequality violations uh, in widely separated photons. But if you have massive objects where the correlations are in the center of mass position, then we've never had a test of this in the history of science. So in order to do this, the first step would be to entangle the center of mass positions of two sufficiently massive objects uh, to try to test to see if Fourier's hypothesis might be true in this untested area of quantum mechanics. Um, now, you might say, well, could there be any kind of alternative to quantum mechanics that would predict anything different in some quantitative sense? And in fact, well, there have been a whole bunch of different proposals for things like spontaneous collapse in quantum mechanics, including these ideas uh, by Biyoshi and Penrose, which are quite famous in modern physics, who proposed there could be some connection between collapse of their wave function and gravity. Since we don't have a good, consistent theory of quantum gravity, uh, this remains a possibility. But I just want to emphasize all of these are local decoherence models. And it's possible that you could have some non-local decoherence, uh, not even described by these models here, uh, which would satisfy the requirements of the hypothesis of Wendell Furry. But if this took place, how could you test it? So in optical mechanics, we know that you can now do uh, entanglement of a mechanical oscillator, which has a center of mass position, with an external laser. So the first entanglement experiments involving optical mechanical oscillators and an external radiation field have now taken place. Uh, at Jilla in Colorado. Uh, and just to make sure we fully understand the quantum mechanics involved in this, uh, we've been doing first principles quantum simulations of these optical mechanical systems. Uh, and just to demonstrate that we can quantitatively predict what quantum mechanics says about such systems. So these are described by uh, something known as the, the standard model of optical mechanics, uh, which couples uh, the optical mode with the mode of the mechanical oscillator uh, has a radiation pressure nonlinear coupling in an external coherent field which brings the energy into the optical mechanical system and all, all of the quantum excitations with it uh, and of course some reservoir that describes the outgoing modes. Now this is the standard model uh, but it is a nonlinear model and because you need to consider uh, all of the external modes if you want to uh, look at entanglement uh, in a deep way, uh, it's, it's a multi-mode uh, problem. Now, the way we can understand this and solve it, and do it exactly, without making any approximations at all, is by using a technique which is derived from some work of, of uh, Roy Glauber here, uh, which is known as the positive P representation, which is a, a coherent state representation using non-diagonal uh, coherent state projectors, and this gives you a positive probability distribution for any quantum state at all. Uh, and it does this by mapping all quantum states into a set of real coordinates which are double the size of a classical phase space. It's an exact mapping. Um, and it's exact even for low occupation numbers. And it can represent entangled states or cat states or any other quantum state. And of course you can use it for both the mechanical oscillator the, the mode inside your optical mode and any external fields that are present as well. Uh, if you work out the equations for the case of the standard optical mechanical model, then you just get a whole bunch of coupled stochastic equations. Uh, you can solve those quite easily. They're not difficult to solve. Uh, and as um, you heard at the start, there's software available which part Partly I've written, and partly some of my colleagues have written. So we have several standard packages now available uh, for download, uh, which you can use to solve these kinds of equations in quite a reliable way, uh, and predict anything you want to measure. And this is a complete, accurate first principles calculation uh, for this open system. Now, just to show you that it's actually working, uh, these are the first measurements demonstrating entanglement of a mechanical oscillator with an external radiation field. 
Uh, these measurements were done at Jilla by Conrad Leonard and his group. Uh, so the predicted behavior is in that black line given the Leonard uh, Jilla parameters. And these are the measurements that were published uh, of the amount of entanglement they observed uh, in their system. And as you can see, they look like they're pretty much uh, in agreement uh, with maybe a single standard deviation error uh, occurring here. Uh, but, well, statistically, you have to have that occasionally. Um, the other red line, by the way, is a, a graph of a different entanglement measure that you could have used. Um, so it's, it's not what they measured at Jilla. Uh, now we try and move on to uh, a more complicated experiment. In order to test the proposal that Furry had of whether two oscillators could become decohere just because of their separation, you need to somehow download an entangled state into two separated optomechanical oscillators. So we can uh, do that uh, by this kind of setup here, first generating entangled states. Uh, these should be a pulsed entangled state because you need to do it at a particular time in order to observe whether the entanglement is decaying with time. Uh, and then you can uh, observe the amount of entanglement after some time has elapsed. Now, the problem here, of course, is that there's lots of decoherence occurring in the system from things like the coupling to the environment, the finite temperature. Uh, of the uh, reservoir here that the mechanical system couples to. Uh, and what is actually very important in doing this kind of experiment is you need to have a perfect method of downloading. You have to download without any losses all of the quantum information in your original entangled system into the mechanical oscillator. Now it turns out there is a protocol for doing this, uh, an optical memory protocol which uses pulse inputs. Uh, and it uses very special pulse shapes, uh, which are basically um, like half inches of this state, this uh, description here, uh, whose parameters depend upon the parameters of the cavity. If you use these pulse shapes, then you can perfectly upload and download uh, entangled states or any other quantum state uh, from one source through a waveguide down into your optomechanical system. Uh, so these are the predictions that we would make um, for entanglement as a function of storage time uh, for the general parameters. And as you can see, uh, as you change the storage time, uh, you can change the amount of entanglement. And it also depends upon the, uh, the temperature of the thermal bath in the, in the experiment. Uh, but you can see here that we can predict substantial entanglement. Anything below 1 is entangled. Uh, and substantial entanglement can occur uh, over relatively long time scales. These time scales are measured relative to the uh, lifetime of the optical system. Uh, and so, yeah, you can clearly do this kind of experiment uh, and generate entangled states with existing optomechanical systems. Uh, but suppose you wanted to go beyond that and actually store not just an entangled state, but a Schrodinger cat make a true mechanical Schrodinger cat, something that actually hasn't been done. Uh, now, that would be really interesting. Can we do that? So uh, in order to answer that question, we have to consider what's the signature of Schrodinger cat. So this is the kind of Schrodinger cat that is now being generated in current quantum technologies. In quantum circuit experiments at Yale, they've now generated exactly this kind of cat state uh, inside an aluminum cavity. Uh, the separation of the alphas in the units that they use at Yale is uh, 100 photons, which means that the alpha noughts are 5, so plus or minus 5. They would call that a separation in phase space of 10, and they would square that to claim uh, a separation in the photon number of 100. When you have that kind of system, you get a Wigner function which is negative going. So this negative Wigner function uh, is a signature of a Schrodinger cat. So you can measure the amount of negativity in the Wigner function to tell you if you have a Schrodinger cat or not. So uh, in order to model that, we can use this uh, positive P representation again, uh, because the positive P representation for a Schrodinger cat has a very simple structure, only has four terms. Uh, and then from knowing the P function, it's possible to calculate the Wigner function and determine whether it's positive or negative. So we take 
the initial p function for the Schrodinger cat, which we imagine is generated uh, in the Yale type cavity, and we imagine a friendly universe where people from Yale and people from Jilla can share a laboratory, and you can download the Yale cat onto the, the Jilla optomechanical system. And what would happen if you did that? We can work out whether the stored cat would still be a cat, because the problem is that these systems have decoherence and thermal effects. So you want to know what's going to happen. Uh, and it turns out that uh, the answer right now is kind of yes and no. If you make a small Schrodinger cat uh, with alpha orders 2, uh, it survives quite nicely with the uh, parameters of the Jilla experiments. If you try to make the full-size Yale Schrodinger cat with the 100 photon separation, uh, then it turns out that the negativity of the um, Wigner function gets uh, very quickly uh, cancelled out by the decoherence. So at the moment, we can say that yes, you could store a small Schrodinger cat using this technology. Uh, if you wanted to try to test uh, quantum mechanics uh, to this point, but a large Schrodinger cat would require that the Jilla people work a little harder to reduce the decoherence in their current setup. So, but we can calculate this completely quantitatively. So it seems that there's lots of interesting things you can do with these optomechanical systems. Uh, and hopefully, with this kind of setup, in future we can try to test to see whether uh, Fourier's possible model. I mean, I'm not saying Fourier proposed this necessarily, but he pointed out this as a possible solution. Uh, and there are potential ways that you can model that within quantum mechanics, or at least by spinning quantum mechanics. Uh, and now we have the technology to actually test this kind of hypothesis. Now I want to move on to a different topic, um, which was a topic that um, was very popular uh, here at Harvard for a while, uh, and mainly because I guess it was proposed by, by Sidney Coleman. Why do you remember Sidney? Okay. <laughs> can I ask a question quick. about the previous part? Sorry? Can I ask a question about the previous part? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, so we also have examples of sort of macroscopic objects being in a superposition state, like superconducting qubits. Sure. So is it, like, what's the advantage of, let's say, doing these uh, optomechanical systems compared to those systems? Those are also pretty large, like you take an entire squid and it has current going this way or that way. So okay. If there was a breakdown of quantum mechanics, you would probably see it there. Maybe. But the, the interesting thing that's been uh, pointed out by, uh, let's see if we go back a little bit. Uh, the interesting thing that's been pointed out by people like Diyoshi and Penrose is that actually one area of uh, quantum mechanical superposition states that's not really been tested at all is what happens when you have two different center of mass distributions that are superimposed. And this is one of the things that people trying to do quantum gravity really <coughs> have a struggle with, because then you have to have uh, a metric tensor, which is in two simultaneous different states, because that's the nature of, uh, of general relativity. I mean, as soon as you have different mass distributions, you have different metric tensors. So that's something that this kind of experiment would give you, which I don't believe you'd get in the superconducting system because I don't think there's too much difference in the mass distribution. And the same thing with photons. When you have two different photons states, there's not much difference in the mass distribution. So what we're looking at here is a, is a case when you can have really two different macroscopic mass distributions uh, in a quantum superposition state or entangled. Yeah? How large are these masses have to be for the superposition, for the superposition of the metric you know, the general relativity want to be, you know, really distinct and important and interesting? Yeah, well, this is a good question. So, since we, we don't have any theory for what, uh, what any sort of fundamentally um, accepted theory for what could be a cause of such decoherence, um, you don't actually know what scale it is. So, all you can do is just test it for different degrees of mass and different degrees of, uh, of separation uh, and try to establish some, some bounds on those parameters. At the moment, 
I don't think we have any test at all of uh, whether quantum mechanics applies to these kinds of mass distributions and positions. So that's the new area. Uh, and well, we can construct some models, but uh, even they have three parameters in them, as as the models of people like Diyoshi and, uh, and Penrose. Um, okay, let me just move on um, to Coleman's model. Uh, this is another model which is uh, more recent, uh, but still been around for a while, uh, around 50 years. Uh, it's the fate of the false vacuum, uh, which was uh, a very famous paper that Sidney Coleman wrote uh, here at Harvard, in which he proposed that a, a quantum field theory could have two stable or quasi-stable vacuum, and if one of them had a higher energy than the other, then there could be a tunneling event where the false vacuum was spontaneously tunneled into a true vacuum. Uh, and the question is how to do the calculation for what happens quantum mechanically in a system like that. Now, then you start to get into quite severe problems with, with complexity theory, because the, the quantum field theory by itself has got pretty much an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Uh, so the only solutions that people have are various approximate solutions. So um, Sidney Coleman uh, used a kind of thin wall approximation uh, to treat that problem and was able to calculate things like uh, tunneling rates. Uh, but he couldn't really calculate the full picture of the final state that would occur, nor could he treat different shapes of potentials. And that's important because in modern cosmology, where they use these models quite widely nowadays, uh, they, they don't use these thin wall potentials. They have a, a variety of different shapes of potentials, but they're generally not these thin wall ones. So the question here is somewhat different to the, the previous question. What I'm going to ask now is can we use the Bose-Einstein condensate as a quantum computer to emulate this kind of quantum field theory dynamics? And I'll try to persuade you that it's not completely impossible, although certainly quite a big challenge. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do, though, is to take a little detour before we get onto that. And what I want to give you is some simulations of possible experiments for this Coleman uh, emulator. But before I do that, I want to persuade you that the, the uh, approximate calculations that we're doing have some reliability in the sense that they may be able to predict, roughly speaking, what an experiment would give you. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is to do a simulation of the coherent BEC interferometer that we have uh, at Swinburne, which is the world's most coherent BEC interferometer of the longest lifetime. Uh, to do the simulation quantitatively, we have to include pretty much everything. We have to put in the finite temperature, because you can't pull a BEC down to zero Kelvin. Uh, we have to put in all the quantum noise effects. It's not a mean field system. Uh, there's decoherence, and of course, this full three-dimensional dynamics occurring. Uh, something like 100,000 modes are present in a full theory. Uh, and that is the experiment, uh, an atom chip experiment uh, constructed by Andrei Sidorov uh, in our center. Uh, the model is just, uh, you have to put in everything you know about a Bose gas. So you put in kinetic energy, the trap potential, uh, coupling between all of the different um, hyperfine states, uh, in in S-wave scattering theory, uh, you, there are coupling fields present. These are microwave fields that are used to uh, change from one hyperfine level to the other to make an interferometer. But as well as that, you have various damping rates. You've got um, one body, two body, and three body losses. And they're described by tensors because it all depends on what channels are being occupied. All of those can be mapped into this uh, stochastic time evolution equation, which we can then model. Uh, and you have to put into the mix the right initial uh, state, which is uh, a thermal state in this kind of system, uh, around about 20 nanokelvins. So we can model all of this. Now let's see what we come up with. First of all, uh, we see these spatial oscillations because the two Zeeman states that are involved uh, have some interaction, so they tend to breathe in and out during the experiment, and that changes the visibility as a function of time when you form these fringes. Uh, what we can do is to calculate the finite temperature condensate fraction, which is quite interesting. What, what we know is that the condensate fraction actually changes in time. 
Uh, it changes in time because interactions between the two condensates. So the two condensates, as they evolve in time, uh, scatter off each other, and this causes heating. So you get uh, a constant increase in the number of uh, thermal atoms occurring. Uh, so the condensate fraction reduces in time, uh, and the two condensate fractions of the two different hyperfine species that are present, uh, they, they actually change uh, because they have different internal loss rates. But all of that can be included in the calculation of the condensate fraction. And, and, and that calculation, if you want to know, is done by working out the, following the penrose onsager idea, you work out um, the single particle density matrix. Right? That's an enormous matrix, um, something like, uh, I don't know, whew, you just think now, around about 100 million components in that matrix, and you have to find the eigenvalues. So um, and you can do that, and, and we've found the eigenvalues, and that's how we get these condensed expressions. Uh, and here's the evidence that we can do this correctly. Uh, these, this is the first principles calculation of the interference fringes, uh, showing that it agrees very accurately with what's predicted in the simulation. So there's some evidence here that we can correctly understand the full quantum dynamics of this BEC. Now, the second test case uh, is another simulation of an experiment which is underway at Rice University. Uh, so, by the way, um, I just want to mention a point here uh, which might be of interest to the people um, in the Griner group, uh, in, because they have a BEC with very similar size and temperature to the one that this is modeling, uh, which is around 50,000 atoms. Uh, and they told me down in the lab about a couple of hours ago that they didn't know what temperature the BEC was, because it was so cold that they couldn't observe any thermal atoms. Um, and, well, actually, that's about what we have in our lab, too. Our condensates are so cold you can't observe any thermal atoms. So, how do I actually know if it's at 20 nanocalvins, right? Um, so, the reason why we know that is because it turns out that this initial part of the interferometry down here, where you can do the observations of the interference fringe visibility very accurately, is actually extremely sensitive to temperature. So, in fact, in this part here, we actually have to fit the temperature to these measurements. That's how we know it's at 20 nanocalvins. If we assume it's any other temperature than that, then we won't fit this initial decay in the fringe visibility. Uh, and then the proof that everything else is being done correctly is, can be seen from the rest of the curve also fitting perfectly. Uh, so this may be one of the most sensitive ways of actually measuring a BEC temperature when the condenser is so cold you can't directly observe any thermal atoms, uh, which is the case in these experiments. So next we want to look at um, a simulation of a second test case, which is an experiment at Weiss University. Uh, this experiment isn't finished yet. Uh, what they do is they make a quantum soliton, uh, which is a one-dimensional Bose gas with an attractive interaction. Uh, and this is described by this kind of model, uh, which is a famous model studied uh, by Liebel Linniger, although they looked at the repulsive case, and this, this case is actually attractive. Uh, but what is known is there are four different local symmetries in the system. Um, so having all of these four different conservation laws gives you a way of testing your theory. Uh, so in this kind of system, in 1D, it turns out these four conservation laws are the particle number, momentum, energy, and this very strange higher water term, which uh, doesn't correspond to any of the normal conservation laws, uh, but it's equally locally conserved as the other ones are. So the first thing we can do is to simulate this uh, experiment at Rice. Uh, now what the experiment at Rice does is it takes a soliton, which can be formed in an attractive BEC, and then suddenly switches the attractive interaction by making it four times stronger. So all of a sudden, your, your soliton changes and starts breathing in and out, and you've quenched it, and so some quantum uh, evolution can occur. Uh, the first thing you want to check is, do we actually satisfy all the conservation laws? So these black lines are all the conserved quantities. As long as they're within these 
blue error bars, uh, we know we've conserved all of the conservation laws. And this is actually important because other methods for doing these calculations don't actually conserve these, all four of these conservation laws. Uh, so the prediction that we make is that uh, in this kind of experiment, um, the, the breather classically will just oscillate like these yellow lines here. Uh, so it just oscillates in space regularly. But quantum mechanically, uh, due to these macroscopic quantum effects, the breather will decay and fragment. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can get similar behavior uh, whether you have 1,000 atoms or 10,000 atoms. And roughly speaking, the Rice experiment uh, in, um, in lithium will be using uh, very similar parameters to these in the range of 1,000 to 10,000 atoms. Uh, so what is actually happening here, and also the reason why variational calculations tend to fail when you try to compare them to this kind of uh, physics, is because what started off as a single condensate, as it evolves in time, turns out to evolve to multiple fragmented condensates. The number of condensates present increases with time. So by the end of uh, the time scale here, in dimensionless time up to five units, uh, you've now got at least seven different eigenmodes present uh, in, the, in the single particle density matrix. So you have multiple fragments of condenser occurring. Uh, and in fact, if you work out correlation functions, it turns out there's very strong uh, non-local correlation functions being generated as this, as this evolves. So these are all testable predictions. This, of course, uh, hasn't been done. But uh, that's the prediction, again, to see if we know what we're doing uh, with these kinds of truncated Wigner calculations. But finally, let's get on to um, the Coleman type experiment. Um, so what we want to do is, if you like, in the modern language, is to generate uh, a quantum computer that can demonstrate quantum supremacy. So we all know that people are trying to do quantum supremacy experiments with a few ions. Uh, and they're going to demonstrate that you can make a quantum computer, which is basically ions evolving in time uh, in a system which you don't know how to calculate um, in quantum field theory because, or, or quantum mechanics because there's too many states present. Um, but you know, why stop at just ions? Why not demonstrate quantum supremacy uh, by basically simulating the entire universe, right? That would kind of be the maximum goal to make. So the interesting thing about um, quantum field theory is that it is exponentially complex. It's also essential to current theories of cosmology. But the energies in these kinds of scalar field models that are currently being used uh, is trillions of times larger than CERN. So you certainly can't redo the CERN experiments with a trillion times bigger budget. I don't think that uh, the American taxpayer would be happy to pay for that, because they wouldn't even pay for the experiment down in Texas. Uh, and probably the European taxpayers also would be a little bit averse to increasing the tax bill by a factor of a trillion. Uh, but what we want to do is to compute what theory predicts with a, a quantum emulator uh, using an ultra ball BEC. And, and just to check to see if we're in the right ballpark, we'll try to do an approximate quantum computer simulation to see what's going on. Now, the, the reason for this, of course, is because the fundamental physics here is the physics of the Big Bang some of the most interesting physics that we can possibly test. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of observational evidence based on the CMB uh, from the Planck spacecraft. Uh, and of course, this is not the actual Big Bang, but it's a snapshot of the oldest light in the universe imprinted when the universe was about three or 400,000 years old. We can't actually see beyond that. Uh, but the quantum models of the Big Bang to some extent, are based on this Coleman theory, uh, where you have a false vacuum tunneling through uh, to a true vacuum. And then the potential energy that you start with in the false vacuum is all converted to uh, real kinetic energy. Uh, and that becomes matter, because as we know, mass and energy are equivalent to each other. So we get the Big Bang occurring, and we get expanding bubbles of the true vacuum. Uh, and maybe you can even get collisions uh, of one universe to a neighboring universe if you believe in this model. 
But how can we do calculations, for example, of the quantum correlations in such a model if we want to take it seriously? Uh, it's similar to water boiling or bubbles in champagne, but it's a quantum system. And it's also relativistic. Time scales are about 10 to the minus 32 seconds, so we have to translate that into a laboratory experiment you can do on some sensible time scales, perhaps of the order of milliseconds. Uh, we have observational moments at the moment, uh, from things like the plane spacecraft, multiple moments, uh, the bicep experiments on polarized radiation. So there's an increasing amount of evidence about, available. Now, let's talk about how to simulate this. It's a very simple concept. You just take two BECs uh, with different hyperfine levels, and we couple them together by using an external microwave field or laser light. Uh, in, in this case, we're going to assume a model with RF coupling. Uh, and the quantum field uh, that's of interest is the phase difference between this BEC and that BEC. Uh, so again, if it was in a true vacuum, it would be stable like that. In a false vacuum, it's unstable and can rotate all the way around uh, to form a true vacuum. So that's what we want to see. Now that's how we can do this in a BEC. Uh, if you can, it turns out that the kind of equation that you want to model is a relativistic quantum field equation. This is the structure that you're looking for. Uh, it has to have a relativistic component. Uh, so you have to have the speed of light present. And we're going to cheat a little bit here because we're going to replace the speed of light by the speed of phonons in the BEC, which is something we can manage. Uh, so the simplest model would be this relativistic interacting quantum field with a scalar inflaton field described by this well-known Lagrangian. Uh, and you're trying to engineer the potential V of phi uh, down which the scalar field rolls. Now to do this, what we propose to do is an experiment using a 41 potassium. It has a fresh bike resonance, which has all the right properties, with zero interstate scattering length at 685. 0.7 Gauss, and nearly equal self-interactions. Uh, the loss rates are not currently known, so I wish somebody would measure those loss rates. That gives us better information about the feasibility of these experiments. Uh, and interestingly, this resonance is not yet observed, um, although it's being calculated to occur, and it's believed the calculations people can do these days of flashback resonances are pretty reliable. So if you can do an experiment at this magnetic field, then this is what the BEC potential diagram looks like. Theta here is the relative uh, population of the two hyperfine states, and phi is the phase. So the idea is the, the, uh, the BEC rolls down this valley here and sees a relative phase potential phi as it, as it travels along here. And if you calculate the physics of the relative phase, it does obey a relativistic field equation. Uh, and you have to do a little bit of uh, path integral calculation, and you can prove that uh, the relative phases uh, will have the right canonical momenta, the right commutators, and the correct sine Gordon equation. Now, you can even do better than that, because uh, by taking the microwave field, which causes this coupling, you can take your microwave field and imagine that the microwave field is basically generating this pendulum, right? That's what generates the pendulum that's going to rotate uh, in your sine Gordon model. Now that pendulum, you can think of as having a sine potential, as a, as a normal pendulum does. But if you modulate your microwave field, right, you make a Kapitza pendulum, uh, which was invented by the Russian physicist Kapitza. And when you do that, that actually gives you a local minimum that you can tunnel through. So you can engineer this potential to have a local minimum or to have any other structure you like just by changing the frequency of the Kapitza pendulum. So uh, when you uh, do such a calculation, what you find is that, for example, in one dimension, you would expect to see vacuum bubbles expanding at the speed of light. And this is uh, an image of what we'd expect to see in one particular uh, realization of the experiment uh, generating 
these two vacuum states that can interact with each other, this point here. Notice here we're generating multiple um, true vacuums. Every time we have a tunneling event like this one here, we generate a vacuum, which is this blue area here. The red is the false vacuum. And you can see the blue vacuum uh, expanding at the speed of light, just as you expect. Uh, but you can have interactions between them. Uh, as, as two of these vacuum interact, you generate uh, these kind of strange oscillating domain walls between the vacuum. Uh, and so the, uh, the vacuums interact with each other as well. Now, we've done these calculations in, in one dimension, that's one space dimension, also two space dimensions and three space dimensions. Uh, to try to get an idea of what happens. And in, in all kinds of systems, we get basically different behavior. Uh, in some cases, extremely complex, um, kind of intercalated true and false vacua occur, especially in two dimensions. Uh, in three dimensions, we get rather complex topologies forming. Uh, and sometimes you get multiple uh, oscillations between true and false vacuum occurring in what appears to be a stable topological fashion. So, so there's incredibly interesting physics that's produced in this kind of model. Uh, but most of the interesting physics actually occurs in the final state. So, so the normal instant time tunneling calculation, it, it just tells you a little bit about what's going on. It doesn't tell you actually what happens in the final state nonlinear dynamics, which is where all of the interesting physics is actually occurring. Uh, and of course, it's that final state quantum dynamics which, if this model is to be regarded as a model of the universe, uh, that would be the physics that determines exactly what we observe around us and the, the density fluctuations that eventually finish up in the CMB. So the interesting physics is not the instanton, but it's the final state dynamics. Now, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a feeling for this. It's hard to um, do a good computer presentation of three-dimensional dynamics because uh, you don't have quite as, you know, we don't sort of have holographic screens yet um, to, to, to give you a lovely picture of three dimensional dynamics. So the next one I'm going to show you is a two dimensional video to give you an idea of what's going on. So this is a mirror stable to the universe. Uh, we've got a local potential uh, which is meta stable. Uh, and so you imagine that the universe is sitting here for billions of years, sitting in a false vacuum doing nothing but just. Uh, experiencing some vacuum fluctuations around the false vacuum. Apart from that, it's doing nothing at all. So, uh, at this, this time, the universe is not very interesting because it's just in a false vacuum. There are no people, no stars, no elements. Now, you may think it'll stay there forever, but what I want you to do is to look down the left-hand corner where it seems as though something is starting to happen here. There's a little bit of red showing through, which is illustrating that the false color is changing slightly. Now, in this representation, black is the color of the true vacuum, right? So notice we've now got a nucleation of the true vacuum occurring. So a little bit of true vacuum has formed, and with the parameters given here, that true vacuum will expand at the speed of light. Uh, and leaving behind, notice that what's occurring inside the region of true vacuum is lots of density fluctuations as it it hasn't lost its energy. All of the original energy of the original false vacuum is still there, but now it's forming all kinds of dynamics inside the true vacuum. And so finally, everything's being converted into a true vacuum, but leaving lots of energy behind and lots of interactions uh, can occur. More things are happening, and more correlations can occur in this final state. So uh, at this point, uh, the universe is now formed, and uh, as a result, I think I'll stop the seminar. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, 
So in the calculation, there's no dissipation. It's completely time reversible. Um, if I change the time arrow, it would go right all the way back to forming uh, the false vacuum again. Now, the problem is, of course, in the lab, we do have a little dissipation, as I explained earlier, but that wasn't actually turned on in this, in this particular calculation. So um, that's probably the main uh, difficulty with doing these calculations. If you, if you think of the quantum computer uh, as being a VEC, you actually really don't want the quantum computer to have any internal dissipation. That's always the problem with quantum computers. Um, so at the moment, um, I don't know of any good target um, quantum computing system that actually has no dissipation. So uh, if you know of one, please tell me, because that is probably the main remaining problem. Yeah. So for the first part of the talk, where you were talking about these emotional modes being entangled. Yes. Here, the key thing about testing quantum mechanics is entanglement, right? It's not just the fact that there can be a superposition. Because, I mean, there are these, there are these experiments where you split basically a BEC by a very large distance. And here you have a center of mass kind of difference of meters in your, uh, in your condensate. Is there a way that you can kind of twist this experiment to add somehow entanglement and use that for the kind of test that you were describing? Uh, the BEC system. Um, I mean, I'm not an interferometer. Yeah. Yeah, that, that actually is a very good idea. Um, I haven't done a calculation in which you can, I mean, it, it's not hard to do calculations in BECs where you've got more than one mode present in which there's some internal entanglement between different hyperfine states. But what you want to have is you, you need to have, uh, what we're trying to look at here, systems where you've got two separated parts of your quantum system, and in each of those separated parts there's some center of mass um, entanglement going, or some center of mass superpositions going on, and they're cross-entangled with some other system elsewhere. Because, that, now you might say, well that seems complicated, but the reason why it's interesting is because all of the paradoxes of quantum mechanics that are known, they, they all occur in these entangled systems with, with separate entanglement. So, I mean, that is the essence of the EPR paradox, um, bell violations, and, and all of the other problems that people are interested in when they talk about paradoxes and quantum measurement theory. Uh, so, so that's the sort of system we're trying to create. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any DEC experiment that's been done in that kind of domain uh, at the moment. Um, the, the, the nice thing about optomechanical systems is that the, the, the final states you finish up with in these mechanical oscillators are sort of quite well controlled and defined. Uh, in, a, in a BEC system, um, you need to have two fragments of BEC um, that are, yeah, that, it, it's a subtle point, but I'll try to explain what the problem is. You, 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 what you don't want to have is, is to have lots of individual atoms um, that are split. Uh, you, you want to have the entire center of mass split. So, uh, th I mean, in terms of um, what we understand in the, in the world of quantum entanglement, this is known as a genuine multi-parton entanglement. You have to have a genuine entanglement where all of the degrees of freedom are completely separated from each other in the entangled state. Now, uh, I, I don't really have enough time in this seminar to talk about these things, but uh, actually next week, uh, Professor Reed uh, will be talking about genuine entanglement and what that implies in terms of quantum mechanics. So I think that's the best answer I can give. That th these systems would be genuinely entangled. With the BEC systems, it's quite difficult to construct interactions that give rise to genuine entanglement in a sense. Did you try to compare these type of simulations to the Coleman formulas, so, so these instant calculations? On Sorry, to, to, to which? Did you try to compare your simulations to this Coleman instanton uh, solutions for the decay rate? Ah, 
Um, well, we, we have done comparisons um, to, well, that kind of formula, and they disagree. <laughs> and we know why they disagree, because the potential has a very different shape from Coleman's potential. So, yeah, that would be... Calculations on what different shape? Uh, okay, maybe we didn't look at a sufficiently sophisticated form of the calculation. Um, as, as far as we can understand the physics, um, th this, this kind of system we're talking about is in a rather different domain from what Norman was studying uh, because of the shape of the potential is different. Um, and we even get different power laws uh, in the decay rates. So, I mean, these are predictions that can be tested. I mean, just in one-dimensional systems already we're seeing differences. So these are eminently testable predictions. So if there's any way you can do that in your lab to, to do this experiment, then uh, by all means, somebody should set it up. I mean, there's very interesting physics here. Uh, but I, I, I don't believe the instanton calculation that Coleman published is really applicable for any kind of potential. Uh, because, you know, the statement is made that these are for thin wall potentials. And we're seeing different behavior for that. In, in these simulations. Mind you, these simulations are not exact, so that could be the problem, I suppose. But it does look like some interesting physics there. But thanks for the question. If you were to give this talk at CFA, your message to the cosmologist would be that you're sort of simulating the early universe with quantum systems? Well, simulating, to, from the point of view of the cosmologist, um, the early universe has, has got two ingredients. I mean, there's, there's some event, maybe in a scalar quantum field, as, as Coleman proposed, and this kind of model is being used by other people like you. Uh, but as well as that, there's gravity as well, right? So uh, as soon as the universe starts to expand, then gravitational effects, the metric changes, and other things are happening on top of this. So what we're doing here is looking at the very start of the universe uh, where the initial change in the scalar quantum field is occurring spontaneously, uh, leading to things like density fluctuations. Uh, we're not including the additional effects of gravity, which occur later on in the inflationary period. Um, so in a sense, it's only half of what the cosmologists would like to see, I would say. But it's the, I think it's the most interesting half myself, but gravity people might disagree. <laughs> so can you predict, for example, like, you know, some properties of this kind of system of these fluctuations which occur, like, in a length scales, or, you know, is there some... Yeah, so, so that's... Sure that's okay. okay, so, so, so here, here, here's what I think is the most interesting problem, um, right from the start, when you ask that question, um, because, you see, I'm doing a calculation within quantum mechanics, right? Now, that means I'm imagining that measurement theory works the way we normally want it to work in quantum mechanics, where the observer looks on the experiment from the outside and projects it into some quantum state, uh, you know. I'm sorry. I should have turned this off. So from the point of view of quantum measurement theory, when you're doing one of these early universe type calculations, the observer is inside the universe, right? So the really interesting thing there is to do a calculation um, which is relative to an observer inside the universe. So you have to somehow put into the calculation the fact that you have an observer there, and that observer's uh, observations are conditional on, on that on that observer even being present there in the first place. Um, so what would, for, so for example, in, in current uh, measurements of the Planck spectrum, right, you can see, say, second order correlations, that's easy to measure, it's a standard thing. Uh, people are now extracting third order correlations, and in the future they may get to fourth order correlations. But all of those observ observations are actually conditioned on an observer being present to make the observations. So actually, what seems like a second-order measurement um, is really, from the point of view 
of the fact that you have an observer there to make the measurement, it's really a third order correlation. So, 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 you, so you first have to understand how to do quantum measurement theory um, to, to try to, you know, in, in a, a universe with the observer inside the quantum system, directly to experiment. But if you want to compare that to a cosmological observation, then you have to consider how to include the fact that the observer is part of the quantum system. And that actually is the most interesting, fascinating question this whole field brings up. How does this relate to quantum measurement theory? Uh, when you have a quantum theory of the entire universe. So, um, and then the question you might want to ask is you might want to say, well, how do you know that this Wigner picture uh, is the most accurate picture of what an observer would see in the universe? Because after all, that's only one representation. In fact, only one sample of that representation. Um, so, yeah, I, I can calculate correlation functions and I can compare it to what you might see in the lab. But what really is interesting is how to relate that to a cosmological picture where quantum mechanics is describing both the observer and the universe. And then you might not even be using the correct operator order in here. So, so those are really interesting questions, I think. But thanks for the question.